Okay, so good afternoon. Today is Thursday, October 7th, and uh, we are at the Teach for, for the Bay session. And this is the three o'clock session, and you can hopefully see my screen being shared right now. The title of the topic is Love Math and Science, Get Your Teaching Credential to Teach Math and Science at a California Public School. Uh, and as you can see in the note there, I've kind of mentioned it a few times before we started recording, but uh, I am recording this session right now. If you don't want to be on recording, feel free to, um, to turn off your cameras or mute yourselves or both. Uh, and if you want to, we did we did some introductions a little bit earlier. If you want to introduce yourself in the chat box and you're not somewhere uh, where you could talk to us out loud earlier, then feel free to tell us where you're coming from, what you're doing now, and where you are on your path to teaching. But from speaking with a few of you earlier, um, we have a couple of scientists engineers who are looking to do something a little different. We have a couple of, I think, early childhood focused people that uh, maybe are interested in math or science or just kind of looking at different pathways. And what I'm going to kind of open up with here is that even though the title of the session says Love Math and Science and is talking about um, teaching math and science uh, at a California public school, this most of the session is going to be kind of general and generic to teaching at a public school in general. And I'll just make a few comments about um, teaching math and science specifically. And if there's questions or discussion that wants that we want to do at the towards the end of the presentation, then um, we can we can tackle those subjects um, at the end. Okay. So when I was messing with my slides earlier, I was trying to cycle through this as one of the slides. So if the, uh, you are interested in uh, becoming a teacher, there's a lot of reasons to consider a career in teaching. And maybe some of these uh, might strike you uh, that you can see in this slide here. Uh, but when we talk to our, our candidates at Cal State East Bay, um, the two that kind of resonate the most that are kind of on this slide are they like working with students, they like working with kids, and they like being able to give back to their community, a lot of times uh, their local community that they either have grown up in and or that they live in now. Um, Kendall, I see your, your uh, note in the chat. That's cool. Um, good to have an East Bay person here. Um, okay, so and like I mentioned earlier, um, I'm with Cal State East Bay. I'm with the teaching credential program in the teacher education department. My name is Jason Chan, and I'm basically a recruiter for uh, the teaching credential program. Um, so if we keep going here, if you'll allow me to share a little bit about myself, I did it a little bit before I started recording, but the main kind of point I want to make before I start sharing this slide is what we talked about a little bit earlier that as you go through your academic and professional career, wherever you are in your academic and or professional career, I encourage you and um, and also I teach at um, Los Medanos, if you can see my virtual background, I teach chemistry at Los Medanos part time. So I teach one semester, I'm sorry, I teach one class each semester at a community college and I teach chemistry. And um, the, the thing that I'm kind of trying to get across in this slide that's talking about my story is Keep your eyes and ears open, never, uh, or keep your eyes and ears open. You never know where life might lead you. So different opportunities may present themselves that you may not have intended to go down that road. Um, and by sharing my story, I hope that this kind of brings this to light. Okay, so in the upper left uh, image, you can see here this little scientist guy, right? And I don't know what it says on his blue shirt inside, but that was me when I was an undergrad. Okay, so as an undergrad, like I mentioned earlier, I was a bioengineering major. And so I was on track to become a scientist and um, I thought that's what I wanted to do. I did internships working in a corporate lab. I, was a, I worked in the chemistry stock room. So I was all about science and I thought I wanted to be a scientist. And so um, after I finished my undergrad, I enrolled in a PhD program. And so I went through my PhD program. I was into my first year and I was working in a lab full time doing my thesis project. And I was kind of unsure whether I that was what I wanted to do because I wasn't really enjoying myself as much as I thought I would have been. And um, I finished up at, this was at the University, University of Washington. So I finished up um, with a master's degree and I decided to go out and work in industry to see if maybe I like working in the science lab better in industry as opposed to at the university. And so long story short, it kind of wasn't that much better for me. So I started to go down the route of uh, commercial. And so I uh, left working in the lab and I started working at a company called IMS Health um, as a 
sales and marketing research analyst. And so that basically meant I was in kind of customer service and client support. And I was going from the lab where I was wearing goggles and a lab coat to now sitting at a cubicle in front of a desk and being on the phone a lot with customers. And so um, IMS Health, if you don't know what it is, is, um, you know, when you go fill a prescription at the pharmacy or for yourself or for, you know, a family member, they collect all that information uh, from your prescription and what, what medication is being dispensed and insurance claims and all that other stuff. And so I was still in the realm of science and biology, but not necessarily working at a lab bench. Okay. So I was working, I didn't necessarily have to wear a suit, but I was working in front of a computer on the phones and a little bit different from what I was doing as a scientist working in the lab. So um, after working at IMS Health for about a year or so, I decided to go get my MBA. And so I got my MBA at UC Irvine and uh, I was working at a company called Allergan, which if you know Allergan, it's, yeah, I see a nod. Uh, if you don't know Allergan, which a lot of my students, when I bring that up, don't know, um, I, I tell them that they they market Botox, Botox, Juvederm, um, eye care, skin care stuff, and um, that usually clicks. But I was working at Allergan because that was right down the street from UC Irvine. And then when I finished my degree at UC Irvine, I uh, worked full time at UC Irvine for about three years. And what happened was my boss at, UC, at uh, Allergan, he was a sales guy. Uh, but he was kind of expanding his own experience working in the Allergan office. But he got a uh, promotion to be a sales director, like outside sales. And um, he was like, hey, Jason, why don't you spend some time being a, in outside sales, being a salesperson? I'm like, are you kidding? I'm like a scientist. And now I work in a, in a desk at a computer. This is good enough for me. He's like, no, you can do it. And it, it would be good experience for you. And do it for two to three years. You can put it on your resume and you never have to do it again. And I was like, how about one to two years and uh, I'll try it out. So anyway, so I went and did that outside sales and I didn't have to wear a bow tie like this, but I did have to wear a tie and a suit. And I had my samples. If you've ever seen drug reps go into doctor's offices, that was what I was doing. So for the first couple of weeks, um, I was in outside sales. And if any of you have done outside sales, and this was before GPSs and before maps on phones and ways and all these things, um, I was mapping out where I was supposed to go for the day and I was getting lost and making U-turns. And then I get to the office and then they say, you have to have an appointment so you can't see the doctor today. I'm like, this sucks. This is not fun. Um, so I was like, you know, in the first couple of weeks, I was like, I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I want to do this. And so um, I stuck with it and uh, I did pretty well. And uh, eventually I got promoted to uh, what's called a region support manager. So basically supporting the, the sales director and then a field trainer. And then I became a district sales manager. So that's me here with a team of salespeople initially. Okay. So um, I went from being an individual salesperson to leading a team. And then uh, from there, I moved from being a district manager to uh, spending some time as the director of commercial operations at a uh, company that did cord blood banking and stem cell research. So that was my last corporate career. And that's me here again, you know, with this group. Um, and my last corporate job I got laid off from, that was like five or six years ago. And uh, as I was driving back, because this, this, um, I was talking to my wife and we had a couple of young kids at the time and like, you know, what should I do? This is the first time I've gotten laid off and, you know, what should we do? And so uh, we decided to try something different and not just go back the corporate route and not find another job. And that's where I got connected with Los Medanos, like I mentioned, that you can see in my virtual background, hopefully. And uh, I've been teaching their uh, chemistry uh, part time, one class each semester for the last five or six years. So now come full circle, I'm you know, we're online right now because of the pandemic, but normally I would be working in a science lab, wearing goggles. We don't have to wear lab coats, but wearing goggles, working with chemicals, and at the same time, still working with students now instead of salespeople or, you know, people in my department, uh, but still kind of working with a team. And so the moral of this story, like I was mentioning before, is when I was an undergrad, I was on track to become a scientist. And many, many, many years later, uh, my road took a few turns and what I do now is completely not what I was expecting before. So that's what I would kind of encourage you all to keep your eyes and ears open. You never know where life might take you, what opportunities might present themselves and, um, and where you might end up. So 
thank you for indulging me on that. Um, and now as we kind of turn it back to what we're here talking about with Teach for the Bay and people that are interested in a teaching career, um, regardless of where you are in your path, um, this is kind of what I have planned to talk about today. So we're going to talk about why people teach, why you might choose to teach, what kind of teaching credential do I need to get, um, why might you choose Cal State East Bay to get your credential, and then uh, if we have time at the end, we'll uh, we'll leave time for questions and open discussion. And um, I try to make this as interactive as possible. So there will be a couple slides where I'm going to ask you for some input or to tell me what you think. Um, so you're welcome to either unmute yourself and say it out loud, or you're welcome to throw it in the chat box, whatever works for you. Um, but I don't like hearing myself talk endlessly. So I'm going to try to get it to be a little bit uh, interactive as much as possible. Okay. All right. Any, any questions, any thoughts, anything you want to bring up for right now? Um, right. Mine would be, uh, ahead, you said, well, you mentioned that uh, the single subject is only in person while the multi-subject credential is online. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. So other single subjects at East Bay are online. Multiple subject and single subject math and science at East Bay are on campus or in person. That's oh. specifically for East Bay. Um, I can't speak for every institution, but that's our setup at East Bay. Okay, gotcha. Okay. All right, let's keep going. So why teach? Why are you interested in teaching? Um, why do you think people pursue the teaching career? This is where you you get, where I'm trying to get a little interactive with you. So what do you think? Why do people teach? Uh, to shape future generations. To help future generations, I think is what I heard. That's that's a good one. Why are you interested in teaching? If I can make it a little personal to to yourselves. Um, I'm interested in teaching. Um, I currently work with really young kids, but mm -hmm. I love kids. Like I love <laughs> working with younger children, um, and just giving them the opportunity and providing them with a safe space where they come and really be themselves and express and open up and just have fun learning, like being able to provide that safe space for them. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Stella, for sharing that. Um, I'll kind of, some people may be typing in the chat box, but I'll share with you another little anecdotal thing. So like I mentioned, I teach, uh, I teach at a community college. And when I came out of um, my last corporate job and we were trying to figure out what we should do, I, I substitute taught for a little while in elementary school. And um, I took about four assignments before I was offered the position at, at uh, Los Medanos. And uh, the first one was PE sub. And on that day, it was raining. So PE on a rainy day is not the most favorite thing to be having to teach. Um, so the first couple of sessions were okay. We were in the gym. And then as lunch approached, they're like, we need to use the gym for lunch. Like, okay, so why don't you take your class to the library? I'm like, okay, PE in the library. That's, that should be an adventure. Um, so anyway, m my definition of a good day for that was nothing got damaged in the library. Nobody got hurt and we made it through. Um, but I was teaching, I did kindergarten, I did uh, science uh, for a day, I did the PE class, and then I did, um, I think, like third or fourth grade. And for me, personally, I found that um, I don't know that I can keep up with the elementary school age kids. And so I teach adults, I have a sixth grader, and I have a fifth grader now, and the sixth grader is in the background right now, hopefully doing her homework. Um, but uh you know, I, I enjoy teaching and I enjoy helping people learn, but part of it also is trying to figure out what age range, what group um, works for you to teach. Uh, I see in the chat box, uh, Darren has in here personal fulfillment, intrinsic rewards, continuous learning as one gets into the profession. Um, Tiffany has in here sharing your love of knowledge, hopefully sparking the same love of knowledge in others. Uh, Darren also has memories of great teachers when he was young and wanting to help people learn. And I'll kind of sum it up here, and I have a couple of talking points right after this, but I'll sum it up here, kind of uh, what a lot of you are saying is that when I teach, whether it's the you know community college students or even young people or whoever, even adults sometimes, 
when I can see that light bulb turn on, when I can see that aha moment, um, like I get a little tingle in my body and, you know, different people have different reactions, but I think most of, you know, if you have been teaching or you've, you know, started kind of tutoring or, you know, going down that path, like when you can help somebody understand something, especially somebody who's been having trouble with stuff, um, it's a good feeling. And so, that's the, you know, that's part of the reason that, that I teach. Um, but I'll share with you in the next slide, some of the reasons that our Cal State East Bay, uh, our credential candidates, they actually told me why they um, decided to teach. And some of them are some of the things that you all have mentioned in the chat box and out loud as well. So they enjoy working with students, right? So that's kind of important. And that is one of the prerequisites to applying to our program, a credential program, is you should be spending some time in a classroom to make sure that you enjoy working with students. And again, specifically, like what age students do you enjoy working with? Because what we don't want is for somebody to go through the whole credential program, uh, commit a bunch of financial resources and, um, you know, energy and dedication to it. And then at the end of it, find out they don't like working with students. So, uh, people, people teach because they enjoy working with students. Uh, we talked about wanting to make a difference in the community. Um, so you can make a generational difference uh, and definitely a positive impact in the community. Uh, nobody mentioned job security, but I think that most of you probably know that there's an extreme shortage of teachers, not only in this state, but across the country. And um, there's definitely a demand for, for teachers. Um, and sometimes uh, our program, our candidates finish their teaching credential in May. Uh, that's at the end of spring semester. And sometimes they'll have a job lined up by like March or April uh, because there's that much demand for, for teachers and uh, for good teachers. And um, maybe some of you have, have this in the back of your mind, but uh, didn't want to say it, but work schedule. So daily work schedule as well as academic year work schedule, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but your work schedule daily is usually like the school day, right? And yeah, you may need to spend some time outside of the school day grading and doing things like that. But uh, one of my daughters, I think when, her, when she was in third grade or second grade, I asked her teacher, like, why did you decide to teach? And she said, well, I have two young children. I have like an infant and maybe a kindergarten or something like that. And she was like, um, you know, I appreciate being able to pick them up from school after their school, because when my school ends, their school kind of ends. And so um, the daily work schedule, as well as the academic year. So unless you're in year round school, the school year is nine, maybe 10 months, right? And you're free to do what you want to do for the summer, whether that's teach some more, or whether that's do something completely different or, you know, uh, whatever you want to do. So um, that's something that uh, the candidates in our program have shared with, with us that they value as well. Okay, here's another graphic um, uh, that's kind of more uh, a survey kind of a thing. Um, but it says, why did you become a teacher? And uh, you might not be able to read all the small print here, but I highlighted uh, the top three. So 85% say to make a difference in the lives of children. And so that's something that you all have brought up. The second one over here on the right side says to share their love and of learning and teaching. So that's another one that you all have brought up. So that's good, we're on the right track. And then uh, the third one, 71% said to help students reach their potential, right? And I think that's embedded in some of the things that you have shared with me. Um, so let me ask you this, why might someone not want to teach? Like if they're interested in teaching, they like kind of teaching people, um, why might somebody like not want to teach if they really, if they, if they enjoy this kind of stuff? Financial reasons. Oh yeah. There, who was that Yasmin? Yeah. All right, I don't know if you can see my next slide. I don't think you can see my next slide, but that is one of the things that comes up pretty often. Um, that is sort of, we call them, when I was in sales, we call it, call it an objection. And sometimes people will say it, sometimes people won't, but whether people say it or not, um, oftentimes that, that can be a consideration, right? So I, I appreciate, Yasmin, you, um, for you bringing that up. How much do you think a new teacher makes? Before I show my next slide, if you can. 70 to 80,000. For a new teacher, like just finishing yeah. credential and with not too much experience? 70, probably. 70, okay. I think. 
I Anybody say else? forty thousand to fifty thousand. Forty. Okay. What's what's your name? Uh, it says iPhone on your phone. Oh, sorry, Kendall Anderson. Oh, Kendall, you're in the chat. Cool, Kendall. Thank you. Anybody else? We got a forty. We got a seventy. All right. We'll do a drum roll. I don't have a good drum roll thing, but so this is from Oakland Unified. Um, and this is Teach for the Bay, and I assume most of us are uh, somewhat in the Bay, maybe not right this second, but um, I think we all know Oakland. So Oakland Unified, this is uh, from their website. So uh, teacher compensation is annually 51000 and this is as of January 2021. And there was supposed to be a 3.5% uh, bump, uh, effective mid-2021, mid, mid 2021, so like a few months ago. So let's call it 55000 roughly right? Straight out of a program, um, not too much experience. And if you can see here, it says salaries are calculated using teaching experience, which is called steps. And then how many semester units after your uh, bachelor's degree you have, and that's in columns. Okay. So when we say up here, step one, column two, that means that you have pretty much no previous teaching experience. And that means that you have um, like 30 units something like what is in our uh, in our credential program at East Bay. Okay, so this is somebody who has very little previous teaching experience, but has finished the credential program, they come out making uh, mid 50s. Okay, which is not not bad, right? Better than 40, but not quite as good as 70. So we'll have to find out where they're offering 70 and send you all there. But um, that's for somebody who's new. Yeah. Jasmine, you're going to share with us where people should go for 70. No, that's my secret now. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. For those of you that uh, know Yasmin or you can connect with her later, she if you make friends with her, she might share that with you. But let me point out that um, in addition to the compensation, just salary-wise, there's also other benefits as well, right? So obviously there's, there's health insurance coverage, medical, dental, vision, uh, life insurance, long-term disability. There's also um, pension. Right. So there's what's called, I don't have it on the slide here, but there's what's called CalSTRS uh, for most uh, teachers. And um, as of right now, at least, it's, uh, it's, it's a defined benefit plan, it's a pension program. Okay. And if you look around like the jobs that are out there these days, back in the day, they used to offer pensions with different companies and jobs, but nowadays, uh, pensions are kind of going away. Okay. So like I mentioned here, this is for kindergarten through high school teachers as of January 2021. Um, and this is the note that I was talking about before. So on their website, they specifically call this out. This is for 186 days per year. So that's like 10 months. And this is for six hours per day. Okay. So if you annualize that, or if you kind of, you know, adjust it based on if you worked 12 months or, you know, um, what that might end up as, then, you know, it, you can compare it to other types of career opportunities that, that are out there. Okay. And I don't have this slide on here at this set, but I have another slide deck that I use oftentimes that, that says um, job satisfaction. Uh, the teachers are very high when asked about their level of job satisfaction, they're not number one, uh, but it's actually number two. Do you have a guess as to what number one might be? Maybe I should throw it in here on a future slide deck, but um, if you hear me present at other things, I, I sometimes use that slide as well. So number two is teachers, number one is physicians. And then, uh, and so that, that was from like a, I think it like a US news kind of a survey. So not only is uh, the compensation pretty, you know, pretty good and maybe not as, uh, not as challenging as maybe some people think without looking into it, but uh, the level of job satisfaction is typically pretty high. Okay. Let's keep going here. Okay. So that's a little bit about why people teach. And if you go into teaching, that's maybe a little bit about what's ahead of you. But in order to teach at a California public school, like we talked about, um, you need to get a teaching credential. Okay. And I think most of you know that. Um, but what you may or may not know is there's different types of teaching credential. There's single subject versus multiple subject. We'll talk a little bit about what's the difference. And then when do I need to decide? And then what if I change my mind later? 
Okay. So single subject versus multiple subject. Um, so if you want to teach in elementary school, kindergarten through uh, fifth grade or sixth grade, depending on what the school district is, uh, you need to get a multiple subject credential. Okay, because for elementary school students, you're teaching multiple subjects. You're teaching reading and writing and math and, you know, um, different, all kinds of different subjects. So if you want to teach in elementary school, you need to get a multiple subject credential. If you want to teach in junior high or high school, you need to get a single subject credential. Because typically by the time they reach junior, uh, students reach junior high or high school, um, they're moving around different classrooms and the teacher typically teaches one subject. Okay, so that's a single subject credential. So again, speaking specifically about what the title of this, this session was, it said math, uh, love math and science. If you wanted to be a math teacher, you need to get a math credential in the single subject program. If you wanted to be a science teacher, um, then there's different levels of science. You can get what's called a foundational science credential, which means you can teach like general science, or you can teach a specific science subject like biology or chemistry or physics or, um, like astrology, geological sciences, but you need to choose the subject that you're going to teach, including some of which you mentioned earlier, English, art, PE, history, uh, world languages like Spanish, French, um, you know, those different types of things. But if you want to teach at a junior high or a high school, you need to choose a single subject credential and choose a specific subject at least to start. Okay. Um, when do I need to decide? So, for our program at Cal State East Bay, um, you need to decide. You need to choose one or the other, single subject or multiple subject, before you start the credential program, because there's slightly different coursework and there's a slightly different path, depending on whether you want to go in our, into our single subject program or a multiple subject program. Okay, and then what if I change my mind later? So this is sort of a uh, kind of a broad question, but let's say that you finish your credential, and let's say that you um finish a single subject science credential okay so if you finish a single subject science credential you're now authorized to teach science um, in california but if you want to teach math later you can always get what's called an added authorization and so what that means is that you need to uh, fulfill the subject matter competency which um, a lot of people either satisfied by the csets or by uh, coursework so you need to satisfy subject matter competency for that subject. And if I'm using this example of I got my credential in science, I want to teach math now, I need to pass like the math subject matter subject matter competency. And I need to teach I need to take one semester of a methods class in that subject. Okay. So if I have a science credential, I want to add a math credential, I need to um, take one math methods semester class, and I need to uh, satisfy the subject matter competency for math. So the main point that I'm trying to make here is that it's never too late. You can always kind of change your course or you can always add on authorizations later if you finish your multiple subject credential, right? So now you're authorized to teach elementary school, but you decide, well, I want to teach middle school. And this is what my brother-in-law did. My brother-in-law is a teacher in the Pleasanton Unified District. Um, he got his multiple subject credential first, and then he got his math credential, I think, for sing single subject. Um, so now he teaches math at middle school. So it's never too late, and you can always kind of adjust and change as needed, but you just you have to satisfy certain things. Um, but you, you can always adjust and change later. Um, and this is... Uh, Somebody brought something up earlier and at my kids school and at certain schools, there's a science teacher like specialist. If you want to teach science in a elementary school, you need a single subject credential in science. So that's the little kind of twist, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, if you want to, if you're a science teacher specifically at an elementary school, um, you, you need to hold a science, single subject science credential. Okay. Any questions on anything that I covered in that slide? I'll give it a couple no. seconds in case. Yeah, Doris, go ahead. Oh, no, I just said no. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll give it a couple seconds to see if anybody's typing in the chat box. Then we'll keep going. 
Um, I have a message in here it's to te teach science in elementary school. Do we need both a multiple subject and a single subject? So I am pretty sure that you just need a single subject uh, in science if you're going to teach in an elementary school. That being said, what I'll say is that not every school and not uh, and I haven't done an exhaustive search across every district, but not every elementary school has a science specialist. OK, so. Um, you know, you just have to kind of look at the district boards and see like which districts and which schools um, have those types of positions. Did I see somebody unmute that maybe was going to bring something else up or no? All right, we'll keep going. I'll keep an eye on my chat box. Okay, so. Um, Again, as you can see from my virtual background and uh, from the program at Teach for the Bay, I specifically work with the Cal State East Bay um, teaching credential program. And so uh, I'm gonna kind of share a few things about the Cal State East Bay teaching credential program that, um, that our candidates value, as well as if you're considering a credential program that you may wanna enroll in, um, some of these may, may appeal to you as well. But at Cal State East Bay, we have what's called a cohort program. And so what that means is that, um, let's say that we admit 200 um, students in a given year. You will be placed into a cohort of about 30 students and you'll take all of your classes with those 30-ish students, okay? So what that allows you to do is that allows you to make some strong relationships and friendships and some longer lasting kind of uh, bonds with people because you're kind of taking all the same classes with the same 30 people versus um you know going into one class and having 30 people then going to a different class and having like 30 different people and it just kind of takes a little bit longer to make those connections with people okay so a lot of our candidates uh tell us that that's something that they value in our program and that's some that's a structure that they they like that is part of the cal state east bay program okay um, another one that came up is that uh, the East Bay program is a good value. So, or let me ask you out there, if have any of you looked into other credential programs or even East Bay, what's the, uh, what, how, how much is it typically to, to, uh, for a credential program out there, like tuition? Um, when I checked last, uh, it was like 20K, but with getting your master's degree at the end mm -hmm. of the program. Okay, so 20K, um, I've also heard there's other programs locally here that are in the 30,000 range, but so in the 20 to 30,000 range, and um, the comment was that it's it's also incorporating a master's. Uh, we offer a master's program as well at East Bay. I, I'm not necessarily gonna go into it here unless you all want me to, but for our program at East Bay, um, uh, so somebody was asking, is the 20K Teach for America? But um, uh, so at our program with East Bay, like I mentioned earlier, our program is three semesters. It's one year. Um, and that also is somewhat shorter than some of the other programs out there. Some of them are two or three years sometimes. Uh, and currently our tuition is about $4,000 a semester. So a total of 12,000 for one year. So people are our candidates, our students um, share with us that they value that it's a pretty good value as far as tuition. And what I'll mention here is that there's a lot of financial resources available uh, for teachers and especially for math and science teachers. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of it right now, but um, there's there's definitely financial resources to help offset tuition as well as other expenses that may be associated. Um, so again, our candidates at East Bay appreciate that it's a good value at our program. Okay. We have high quality faculty and instruction. Um, most of us are in the Bay Area. Uh, so for a lot of us, East Bay is local, it's close to home. Uh, and some people say it's it's my community, like you know, their community. Uh, I'm, I think most of you know the Hayward campus, which is up on the hill. And then we're, we also have a Concord campus. So some people will take classes there. And then we also have a, a few classrooms in Oakland, but I don't think our teaching credential program, we, we do classes in the Oakland campus. The main ones are the main one is Hayward, and then the main satellite one is in Concord. Um, and then this is what I was talking about earlier. So there is a fully online program available, not for math and science, and then also not for the multiple subject credential. But if any of you are um, 
interested in or thinking about a single subject credential in a different subject like English or art or PE or um, and they're all listed on our online program um, credential website, there is a fully online program available. Um, let me make this note also. So even for our on campus programs, our quote unquote in person programs, um, math and science and multiple subject, especially not all of your classes necessarily are going to be on campus or in person. So they could be a mix of on campus in person and or fully online and or hybrid. And that's up to the discretion of the uh, instructor of that specific class. Okay, there's certain classes like our math methods and our science methods classes that are typically always on campus in person when COVID doesn't mess with things. But uh, other classes can be fully online or hybrid or in person. And that's up to the instructor for that specific class. Okay, I think these are the, my last couple slides. So if you're interested in applying to the Cal State East Bay program, our program uh, always starts in summer semester. So the next upcoming academic program year starts in June, this, this coming June. Uh, that group will finish their program in spring semester, so May of 2023. Uh, and then our applications open in January, this coming January. The application deadline is in April. And our application requirements uh, this is the link for our, our on-campus in-person program. And um, let me kind of, I, I usually highlight this. Uh, the items that sometimes take a little bit more time in planning are the subject matter competency, which is often satisfied by CSET exams, and early field experience, which is typically 45 hours that needs to be spent um, with students and in, a, in classrooms. For this coming year, the 2022 application period, the early field experience is suspended for right now uh, because you know we're still kind of dealing with some COVID things. So the 45 hour requirement is not requirement this year, but we still encourage people if possible to get experience with you know either classroom setting and or working with student, um, student age kids. Because again, like we were saying earlier, we don't want you to go through the whole program and then at the, you know, when you finish the program, you find out, I don't like working with students. Um, you know, that's not uh, the best use of people's resources and um, time and money and stuff. Okay. Uh, I see the, the question in the chat box. Um, let me, I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. But let me kind of wrap this up a little bit and then I'll, I'll kind of take questions and then we can kind of do some open discussion. So the last few slides that, uh, the last couple of slides that I wanna share with you are just kind of to kind of wrap us up and to send us on our way. So again, you know, when I teach and when I talk to people that teach or wanna become teachers, um, I like to kind of leave with a few different things. So whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're usually right. Okay, so I say this to my students and I say this to people that, you know, wanna become teachers or just anything that people wanna do. So a lot of times, um, you know, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're, you're usually right, because it kind of starts with you, okay? Nobody, I'll never say that the stuff that we do is easy, but it can be done, right? But you just, you have to kind of put some effort into it, and sometimes you need to, to find resources to help you out, okay? This is one that I live by, especially when I teach, is they may forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Okay. And another way that that's kind of said is um, people don't usually care about what you say unless they know that you care. Okay. And so, you know, at the end of this thing, after talking to you all for like 45 minutes, maybe almost an hour, you may not necessarily remember most of the words that I'm telling you, but hopefully we made somewhat of a connection that you feel good about the path that you're on, that you kind of found out a little bit more information. And if, uh, you know, if we want to connect later on, we can connect later on and talk more. And then I'll leave you with this last one from Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And we're not gonna open a whole discussion right now about all the problems and challenges going on in the world because that can be its own whole session. And uh, maybe that's not the best tone to end on. But um, you know, we got a lot of problems going on, a lot of opportunities, let's call them, that, uh, that we can do better. And so education is, um, you know, improved education and helping our communities may be one step towards improving a lot of things that are going a little wet, wacky right now. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm going to wrap that up. And here's my email address. I'll throw it in the chat box as well. Uh, but you're welcome to reach out to me. 
Let's see if I can type and talk at the same time. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me by email. You're welcome to set up a Zoom session with me um, by using my Calendly link. So if you haven't used Calendly, if you go to calendly.com slash CSUEB teacher info, and um, I can, I don't know if I can copy paste that. Uh, you'll see my schedule and my openings and you can schedule a session that is convenient for you. And um, you will probably get emails from me now. Uh, we do a monthly webinar series where we um, do discussions and bring in guest speakers sometimes focused on topics around teachers and the teaching community. Uh, right now they're all online because of probably obvious reasons, but sometimes we try to do some in person, uh, but they're online right now and there's no charge uh, to attend them. So, and we do record them. So if you register for one of our webinars and you can't make it live, I send out access to the recording um, after we finish. So with that, I am going to wrap it up and stop sharing my screen so I can see more of you. Um, and thank you for joining. I know I have some questions in the chat box that I will get to, um, but I appreciate you all joining for the session and hopefully you were able to pick up some info from this and, um, you know, make some connections with myself and others. Uh, and hopefully you were able to get some of your questions answered. So thank you for joining and let me um, see what I have in my chat box and I'll start answering some questions and, and this is basically time just kind of for open discussion. And what I might do, this is what I do with my class too, is I might cut it maybe five minutes early and I'll turn off the recording in case people want to ask things off recording. Okay, so I have a question in here. I heard it's better to get credentialed in the region or area that we want to teach in. If I'm not from the East Bay and I'm not interested in teaching there, would it still be a good idea to apply and go to school there? Okay, so this is a, a, a valuable question. This is one that I get um, sometimes, especially when I get a lead from the online program that could be coming from somewhere that's not in the East Bay. So part of the credential program, part of the curriculum is that you will be doing field work, meaning you would be, you'll be assigned, let's just use single subject, for example, you'll be assigned a, a school and a classroom, either middle school or high school. And during the daytime in fall and spring semester, you'll be at your assigned middle school or high school um, completing your field work. And so, um, the comment that's in the chat box that got sent to me is true. And so if you, so what we recommend is that you do your credential program, especially your field work um, in an area where you might want to end up. Because if you are doing your field work there, it's kind of like a on the job or a pre-job interview. They're, they're going to start to get to know you. You're going to start to get to know people in the district and for better or for worse, hopefully it works out for you well. But, um, you know, if you want to teach, for example, in Sacramento or you want to end up in Sacramento and you're doing your field work in Oakland, let's just say, you'll still get valuable experience. But there's also a component to the professional relationships that you're going to develop while you're doing your field work. OK, and a lot of times people end up at the same school where they did their field work during their credential program. So the short answer to that question is. We usually recommend that you do your credential program in an area local to where you want to end up. Okay, it's not required, and you can always, you know, again, there's a large demand for teachers across the state and across the country. Um, so that's not to say you can't get a job somewhere else, but if you've had a job before and if you've made good professional relationships before, you know the value of relationships in addition to just, you know, applying for a job. Okay. Why math and science are only on campus? What is different in this program? So with our math and science educators, um, so my colleagues, Dr. Michelle Korb and Dr. Julie McNamara are the main two science and math educators um, that teach the methods classes. And so, uh, and I, again, I teach chemistry at the community college and I'll just kind of speak from this perspective that if you have taken a science class, let's just say, or even a math class, there's we're doing online lab simulations right now for my class and there's a difference in being able to touch the you know the, the chemicals the bottles the reagents to doing things that are live and in person that just don't come through as effectively when we're doing it in two dimensions even though that's just you know because of the public health situation right now that's what we're required to do so um 
Dr. Corb and Dr. McNamara can speak more to that. And if any of you are interested in the East Bay program, um, I can help you get connected with them directly to talk more about it. But there are things in the math and science program that uh, don't come through quite as, um, how do I want to say, impactfully if you're doing it on a two-dimensional screen as if you're doing it in person. Okay. All right. There's a question here. I'm a liberal study major with a minor in math. I want to teach as elementary school, then work my way up to middle school. Can I do that with the liberal studies major? What? Uh, oh, that, so that's the first question. So I'm a liberal studies major. I want and uh, and I want to teach as an elementary school teacher. So yes, that is possible. So you can do the multiple subject program and become an elementary school teacher. Um, if you want to teach in middle school, you'll have to get a single subject credential, though, um, because like for the reasons that we were talking about before, you can do either one with the liberal study major. And let me kind of make this general comment. So part of the application requirement is that you satisfy subject matter competency in the subject that you want to teach. Right. So um, if you want to be an elementary school teacher, you need to sub satisfy subject matter competency for the multiple subjects. So that can be either by a liberal studies degree, that can be through the multiple subject C sets. Um, and if when you get to middle school math, then you need to satisfy subject matter competency for math. Okay, so that's a little bit different. Um, so you can teach anything you want with any major that you have, but uh, you need to demonstrate that you have subject, subject matter competency in that subject. And um, and uh, what was I going to say? It doesn't restrict you from teaching that, but you just you may have more background and experience in that subject. But as long as you demonstrate uh, competency in that subject, you can you can teach that subject. Okay. What is the teacher residency program? Um, there are residency programs. Um, let me let me come back to that because uh, I need to clarify what that person might mean by that. Uh, and I don't want to kind of take too much time and get us off on a tangent on that. Uh, Doris is just saying she needs to take off. Here's another question. Bachelor's in 2004, master's in 08, degree still valid. Um, so as far as I know, degrees do not expire. Um, let me kind of mention this. And we did a webinar last week uh, talking about the legislation to expand the ways to satisfy basic skills requirement as well as subject matter competency. Uh, so for basic skills requirement, uh, there's a lot of different ways that you could satisfy that. But one of them is with the CBEST. If you pass the CBEST, that's good for your whole life. Okay. There's other ways to satisfy this uh, sub basic skills requirement as well. With subject matter competency, there's now... Um, legislation that expands the options to do that, including coursework and your specific major in your bachelor's or master's degree, okay? And so without getting into specifics about uh, Sumija's situation, if she completed her bachelor's in 04 and master's in 08, um, as long as it's from like, you know, a, a, a institution that is, you know, recognized or I don't know her specific situation off the top of my head, I don't think the degrees expire. It's just a matter of making sure that there's equivalency or there's um, uh, like the coursework was satisfactory and, and it equates to like, um, you know, what we're looking for. Again, and I'm not a credential, I'm not part of the credential analyst team. There's a team that does all of that in a lot more detail than I know, but I just kind of uh, give the general answer and, and specific situations um, I run are evaluated by the credential analyst team. All right. Any other questions that people want to throw in the chat box or you're welcome to unmute. And if the person with a question about the residency program wants to clarify what they're trying to ask, I can try to tackle that. Oh, with the residency program question, I see that there's a link on East Bay saying that they have a residency program, but I didn't know how that worked because they said that on the program, that they would pay 15,000, 21,000 teaching in Oakland for four years okay. versus the actual teaching credential program. Yeah, I got you. Okay. So uh, it's not necessarily instead of, but we have a 
we work very closely with Oakland Unified and there's another organization that is called Trellis, Trellis Education that we work with. And um, you can get financial support uh, as well as mentorship support through Trellis and Oakland Unified, where you can be paid while student teaching during your credential year. And then after your credential year, if you continue on to work in Oakland Unified, um, you can also, uh, you know, you'll be employed through them. So it's called the Oakland Teacher Residency. If you want to Google it or we, you know, we can talk about it offline later. But uh, we work very closely with Oakland Unified. There's specifically um, the Oakland Teacher Residency Program, which is maybe what you're talking about. And usually that's done in conjunction with Trellis. Okay, and just to clarify, it's not during the same time as you're in the residency program? So somebody who is a trellis, uh, somebody who's in trellis and the Oakland teacher residency would be doing their credential through Cal State East Bay at the same time. So let's just say, you know, if you're doing your credential this coming year uh, at East Bay, you would also be part of Oakland teacher residency. You'd be getting paid while student teaching. And then after that, you would be teaching in Oakland Unified. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Got it? Okay, cool. And I know we're right at the four o'clock hour and some of you are, are uh, saying in the chat box, you have to take off, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording for right now. And uh, if anybody wants to hang out and ask questions off recording or just kind of chat, um, we're welcome to do that. But I'm going to stop the recording and um, thank you all for attending. If you're taking off, then best of luck to you and wherever your path might take you. And thanks for spending a little bit of time with us this afternoon.